The doghouse? Oh, that's good. Uh, Feel free to stay alive. Yeah, so, so you know where a uh, scavenger bird's favorite place to live is? I think we're going to do it like we're doing now. And then a I condominium. Oh. oh, we can maybe be able to do that. I'm taking that one. Okay, take it, take it. All right. Uh, Assistance animals are the issue that we get the most questions about, um, in part because um, assistance animal as therapy are, is relatively new. Uh, the scholarly stuff that we've been getting on assistance animals has generally happened since the turn of the 21st century. Um, their animals as treatment plans are not just for people who are blind. Uh, they've got benefits for people who have PTSD, people who have anxiety, uh, people who have diabetes, people who have all kinds of other disabilities. Um, so naturally, as uh, treatment providers are looking more and more into using animals as treatment uh, and recommending it more and more uh, for their patients because uh, you don't, when you're, when you're telling somebody to get an animal rather than prescribing them a drug, uh, you don't have to worry about whether the animal is generic or not. Um, spoiler alert, uh, they are all generic. Um, they're a lot less expensive. Uh, they are a lot less addictive than many kinds of medication. Uh, tell me about your cats later, though. Um, so, um, there are a lot of different terms we use talking about essentially the same thing. Um, and in the housing provider world, uh, we are, they are all essentially the same thing. Um, but uh, the word service animal comes up a lot, and that's what we talk about in the Americans with Disabilities Act when we're talking about public spaces. Um, service animals are limited to dogs and miniature horses. Uh, did they ever do that thing with the capuchin monkeys? I heard they were talking about getting capuchin monkeys in there. They didn't do it. Um, Not that I know. Yeah, uh, a service animal has to be trained, either at home or professionally, uh, to do something that ordinary animals do not do. So a dog that is trained to guide their blind friend around, a dog that is trained uh, to detect when your sugar levels are getting low, um, ordinary animals do not do that. The kind we deal with a lot here uh, in the Fair Housing Act, uh, HUD has not given us a preferred term for it. It can be an assistance animal, it can be a companion animal. Sometimes it's an emotional support animal, but sometimes they're supporting things that do not have to do with your emotions. Um, that applies to homes, dwellings, under the Fair Housing Act. Uh, if you have a question about whether or not you are a dwelling, like uh, an RV park or a timeshare, um, there's a lot of reading to do about that. Um, again, I put a typo in this thing and I didn't notice. Um, so it should say no species or breed restrictions, uh, but again, famously detail oriented, I screwed that one up. Um, HUD has not said that there is a maximum number of animals you can have. Uh, we have case law that says two birds and two cats can be okay. Um, that's the most we've heard about numbers from HUD or from uh, the courts. Um, and they don't need any more training than an ordinary animal would. So Mike, can I interject? So yes. Lauren, do you want to give, or, or Rick, any um, discussion on uh, when they have multiple animals? How, how you best practices for addressing that? Are you going to talk about it later? Or, because I think this is, that's a question we always want to ask, right? We have people who ask us, who call it a mountain all the time. So I, Yeah, I mean, I guess first it depends on the animal. Um, so I thought that the weirdest one we had come across, not weirdest, but you know, most, uh, most unique accommodation request for an emotional support animal was five chickens, it had to be five. And that was until the yak. Um, so <laughs> Never had a yak. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so no one has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more or less. It's like an indoor-outdoor yak. <laughs> Pretty convertible. Um, okay. So it really does. I mean, five chickens, honestly, if you've had one chicken, five chickens is about the same thing, really. They're, um, they're not going to be horrendous. But when we start talking about 19 cats in a one-bedroom apartment, we might have to start talking about reasonableness and um, really clarifying that necessary, what, what makes that 19th more necessary to alleviate symptoms of your disability than the 18th or the 17th. So it is, 
I think just really fact specific as all of this stuff is. Um, but I, I, I wish I could give you a, a bright line, but there isn't one. I wish I had the yak one. That is wonderful. <laughs> I have dogs and cats. I, the one example that occurred to me was um, we had a, uh, a mom and daughter. Daughter had a um, service cat, and mom had a service dog. Not a, excuse me, a, 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 a uh, assistance cat, and mom had an assistance dog. Uh, what happened was they had another cat at one time that they'd actually paid a deposit on, and the cat ran away. Well, the cat came back, and uh, they went to the landlord and said, look, I, I, my daughter needs this other cat as well as a service animal. And uh, the uh, housing provider did ask for some sort of uh, proof from uh, a, provider's, a medical provider indicating why this person needed this other cat, and didn't, they did not provide it. And so therefore, we were able to say no. You know, you haven't done any. You haven't discriminated. You, uh, you know, you you do have the right to ask why, and I think that's the thing to emphasize that service animal is needed. So they already had a cat. They already had a dog. Why do you need a second cat? Never came up with the the uh, uh, information about why she needed it. So that was that. There was no discrimination. That's the way we looked at. It. Yeah, if you've got proof, if you've got the proof of need for more than one animal, mm -hmm. uh, then you're fine. It sounds like the situation there was that they didn't have the proof of need. Of the like second that. one, right? Okay, question yeah, back. The five chicken thing interests me for one reason and one reason only is my son just bought a house and he wants chickens. The city of Pocatello will only allow five chickens. <laughs> <laughs> it's the magic so number. If, yeah. if they went six. Would that be a reasonable accommodation with the city of Pocatello too? Yes, yes, you can. Repeat the question. Yeah, so, so the question is if you have a city, uh, I'm repeating it for the people watching us on YouTube. Um, <laughs> so if uh, your city has a cap on the number of animals somebody can own, uh, but uh, their disability requires, to, requires them to have more than that cap, what do they do? The answer is yes, you can ask a city for a reasonable accommodation and say, hey, I know you've got this ordinance that says I can only own five chickens, but because of my disability, I need chicken number six. And then they assess it in the same way that a housing provider would assess it. Uh, so is that the same thing for county? OK, same thing for county? Yes. Any government entity that has the authority to cap the number of animals that you own. Uh, the feds, that's probably not going to work on. Uh, but if you are dealing uh, with city or county or HOA or any other organization that is laying things down that is not the federal government, uh, you've got the authority to do that, to and ask for the accommodation. Requesting that accommodation would be the uh person who wants the animal's responsibility. Correct? Yes. That said, if you are, say, a landlord of somebody who wants to do that, and you think that they are a darn good tenant, um, and uh, you you can come along and say, hey, my, my tenant needs this, and then if they turn it down and you lose the tenant, you have a fair housing claim against the city. Because you lost the tenant that you wanted. You're out money because you have to go and replace that tenant. Um, because the city make an unreasonable decision. Like we've had this situation before with uh, people who wanted to rent their homes to be used as group homes for people with disabilities. And when cities or HOAs or somebody else are shutting them down, the landlord comes back and says, you've caused me to lose a good tenant. So I have as much of a fair housing claim as uh, this group home does. I had a question up front too. What are the financial restrictions, so to speak? Because I'm not, I'm not a housing owner or anything. But a lot of the time, you know, you go in and you have a dog or a cat, you pay an extra deposit. Are there any restrictions as far as how much money people have to put out in order to accommodate the assistance animals and that kind of thing? Uh, question is, can you charge a fee for an assistance animal? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, you treat an assistance animal in the same way that you would treat uh, somebody who has a walker. Uh, you can't charge an assistance fee for having an additional fee for having a walker. You can't charge an additional fee for having an assistance animal. Um, some people, uh, the immediate question I get about this is, uh, well, animals have a way of causing some damage, uh, so what happens if they cause damage? If the animal causes damage, you treat it the same way as if anything else had, char had caused damage, you charge it to their deposit. If uh, deposits uh, 
are regularly not covering this kind of damage, you have the option of increasing the deposit for everybody, but you don't have the option of only increasing the deposit for people who have assistance animals. I saw two more questions in the back. Did I answer them? Okay, I answered one, did not answer the other. Can you require, like, so if somebody, where I work, somebody came in and they had a note as an animals, mm. but it didn't specify, and so usually what we do is we require a proof of need letter for if they have two assistance dogs. Is that allowed, or? Okay, uh, question is, can you uh, specify the animals that are going to be on the form, or can they just come in with a generic letter that says they need animal? Um, so what, what's your call on that? Yeah, I think it, I think it depends on the facts and circumstances. I mean, we're, we get people, we've seen both. And so if they've got a proof of need from a reliable, a credible provider that says they need those animals without specifying what those animals are, we will say, hey, you know, we would encourage them to clarify it because that solidifies their, their if the housing provider denies it, then that makes their case stronger. So I'm saying from our perspective of advocating on behalf of the person with the disability, we would suggest that because I think it clarifies it. If you require it, it might be problematic, but I don't think that it would cause, you know, if you're having that clarification to the, as to that animal, but you want to have that interactive process of if, the, you know, the one dies, are they going to, are you going to ask for another one, those types of things. So deal with the issue at hand and say, you know, we, we just want clarification. We're a fair housing provider. We're going to grant this. We want you to specify which one it is, what animal it is, and then go from there. And Lauren, do you want to give best practices? Yeah, um, I think as a housing provider, you have a right to know what the accommodation is that they're asking right. for. And I think, you know, part of that is, you know, going to deal with what kind of community are you representing? Are you a no pet community? So bringing in two big dogs is going to be a huge deal. Or do you already let pets in? Does it, does it matter if it's a dog and a cat, two dogs? You know, what are those circumstances? I don't think it's going to matter in the end as far as granting or denying. Mm -hmm. But I do think you have a right to know what they are asking for. Um, not that you know not that you want to be asking the whole breeding history or anything else that's excessive and not related but i do think that it's acceptable to to ask you know exactly how many you know so especially when you're going to give them a grant cats can they have like 10 cats you know what i mean like if it doesn't specify a right and when you haven't granted an accommodation that's specific and you've just said okay you can have cats and now you're in a hoarding situation what are you going to do? You know, you're, you're left in kind of a, a really um, hard area. So I, I do think you have the right to ask for some limited information, but I would definitely, you know, do it respectfully. Right. Do it with, you know, the, the conveyance that you're going to commit to the Fair Housing Act and, and enforcing it. But, but yeah, I do think you can ask. Yeah, and remember that hoarding can itself be a separate disability, which may require a different accommodation. <laughs> uh, if you're wondering how the people on the TV show Hoarders are actually getting extra time to clean out all the stuff that they have in their house, it's probably because they got a reasonable accommodation saying, yeah, this happened because my hoarding disorder was untreated. That's why I need some extra time uh, to move out. Or another Right, another disability triggering hoarders. Uh, or to, not triggering hoarders because that's the name of the show. <laughs> triggering the disease that caused them to appear on hoarders. Okay, question. Say you have a tenant that brings in a, a note for a assistance animal and it says on there they need a cat. My daughter needs a cat for anxiety. Well then you go over to the unit for something. There's not a cat, there's a ferret because the cat didn't work out, so they just got rid of it. Can I require another note saying that the ferret <laughs> is an assistant, or do I just have to go with the first letter? So how... Uh, can you repeat the question yeah, so, so the, people can So the hear? question is, uh, the person uh, gets an accommodation to have a cat, um, and then later they, uh, they replace the cat with a ferret without telling the housing provider, do they have to ask for a separate accommodation uh, from the housing provider? Um, so when thinking about that, how, uh, to a housing provider, how is them having a ferret different from having a cat? What different rules, yeah. And they bite. And they pee. Yeah. 
So, 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 so you make could sure have that's an in your justification. Oh, okay. So you could have an interactive dialogue with them, and um, we'll set aside the East River case where they did not know that they had any assistance animal at all and still prevailed because they evicted the tenants. We'll set that aside. And I would go through that interactive dialogue and I would say to them, um, I, you're a fair housing provider. We recognize that you have a proof of need for a cat, correct? Um, and I would just respectfully to clarify this, my understanding, um, you know, we will we'll give you a temporary approval for the ferret, but if you could go, please make sure you go back and, and work on getting a proof of need for the ferret. And I agree with, for us, if we were bringing a case with Lauren that, and I'm sure Mike would say this, our general counsel would say this, is we want to dot our I's and cross our T's as much as possible as well because we want we want people to to go through this process to make sure if you have a disability, you do, you document you have the need you know for the animal or whatever the parking space whatever, um, and so if they've gotten a, if they've gotten a ferret, they still have to have care and control. They still have to maintain the property. There are some animals you know, like ferrets where they have that stigma, and you can think of other animals that have that stigma but that they're perfectly fine and really good. I mean, the chickens thing has just come forward where there are a lot of people getting service animals that are chickens, but they still have a responsibility of care and control, and you still have city ordinances, county ordinances um, that have regulation. If it's an exotic animal, see, people are having little hedgehogs that are like this big that are considered exotic animals, but in some cases they make really good uh, assistive animals but the same thing if your city prohibits that assistive animal because they prohibit you having exotic animals without XYZ licensure or something again you write a reasonable accommodation you see whether or not it's reasonable we have not gotten those cases I don't I think can say I don't think we've ever gotten a request anything. for something that wasn't a common domestic animal we haven't and when we have when I've had the multiple animal situation I'm like Lauren, if some, or maybe it was Rick, someone came back and they didn't bring that proof of need, or if I called the qualified professional or a colleague did and they didn't support it, or I said, you know, you said you needed this for, you know, your, your, um, your heart, but in fact, you know, you gave me a neurologist, so, you know, that's gonna be a little, and that's something we, can, we are at liberty to do, but we know that once we file with HUD, or we go to court, or you're gonna, get, you're gonna have Lauren on the other side, she darn sure the investigator is going to ask your qualified professional did you need it do you have a disability did you need the animal did you need the parking spot did you need you know whatever the thing is we know in a deposition they're going to ask it so you have to dot your i's and cross your t's you just do it's just that if you're put in a difficult position and you don't know the answer the best thing to do is to call someone who knows more than you do and oftentimes if someone even calls us I'll say, go get a second opinion, call so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so. and then you're fully educated. You're fully educated and you do what Zoe said is, we're Zozo. <laughs> you document it. You know, you have to, do and Lauren's gonna talk about that because she's, that's, she's the expert on all that for housing providers. So, but I, you know, document, document, document. So. Yeah. All right, uh, let's get to the next slide and see if it answers some questions. And then uh, we'll take what happens after that. <laughs> okay, here are some no-nos. Um, First of all, uh, don't charge a deposit or pent rent uh, for an assistance animal. Remember, no fees for accommodations. Um, don't restrict species, breed, or age. There may be some really weird situations uh, where you may consider that as part of reasonability, but it's usually not going to pop up. Um, if you have an insurance provider that is saying, I'm not going to insure you if you have a particular kind of am animal, you can ask for the reasonable accommodation from the insurance provider. Um, don't put unreasonable restrictions on the animal. Uh, you see this woman here has an assistance lizard. Uh, it appears to be wearing a leash. Some people will put on rules saying, you know, your assistance animal has to be on a leash. Dogs are usually on leashes, cats sometimes. Lizards? <laughs> what if they have a turtle? So you can find them if they run away. Yeah, yeah, that's true. If you have a turtle, it's not an issue. They don't run that fast. <laughs> yeah, you can probably keep up with your assistant's turtle. You don't really need the leash unless you're taking him for a walk, in which case he'll probably just follow you. Um, you don't need to require the proof of need to come from any particular provider. Uh, some people will say, uh, I'm not going to consider it if it doesn't come from a provider in Idaho. Well, number one, um, 
that stinks for you if you live in some place like Preston and you're probably seeing a doctor in Logan. Um, that stinks for you if you're a college student and you may have gotten this recommendation from your doctor back home. That stinks for you if you've recently moved to the area and you may have got the recommendation from the doctor back home. Um, if you watch Investigation Discovery as much as I have, uh, you have probably seen ads for legitimate online counseling services that do a bunch of stuff not just recommending assistance animal, and they can be based anywhere in the country, and it stinks for you if you're seeking medical care from them. Um, don't call the proof of need provider, as I mentioned before. Um, it's best not to contact them at all. If you're in a really unusual situation that requires you to do it, make sure your contact is in writing so if somebody comes back asking you questions about what you said, you can prove it. And don't put an unreasonably small cap on the number of animals. It's gonna depend on their size. Uh, if you had a rule that says uh, five animals only, thinking people are coming in with cats and instead they come in with mice, uh, then five might not be such a big deal. We know two birds and two cats are okay. Um, question. Okay, so now I go back to the timeline. Let's say I want proof of provider because you get these forms online. What's the stop by for Charlie can sign it saying that he needs it? Do they, it's an automatic to person. How do we how long do we have to get this proof verified? Okay, so the, the, yeah. the reason being is that if it takes several weeks, I have other qualified applicants and they get the service provider, doctor, doesn't they ever answer my, my letter? Yeah, so the question is, uh, once uh, you've got this coming in and you've got a uh, proof of need form, uh, what do you do next? Uh, how, long, how much time do you spend looking into that proof of need to make sure it's genuine? I'm deferring to Lauren here. <laughs> she loves it when I do this. Man, well, you know, it, it, it is really always a case-by-case -case basis, but the issue with verification of that disability or that proof of need comes down for for me to reliability so if you're getting a doctor's letter you know really there are very few times that you have cause to question it there certainly are times um and you know there are processes for that we've done that i've done that but if you're getting a letter from somebody's uncle and it's not full of detail might be a time that you push back. I, I would uh, be really concerned though about you going to an applicant who applied later than the person who has applied and qualified but needs an accommodation. Um, so it, I might just let them in with a temporary accommodation and, and move on down the line. Um, you know, some of the things to look for in that verification of whether that's reliable information um, you know, somebody's mom might write them a letter, um, and that might be, I might find that to be reliable information sufficient to show disability and necessity when they can talk about all of the specific instances, um, you know, give a lot of detail and, you know, not, not about the nature or severity of the disability, but really be able to show that they have an understanding Okay, uh, yeah. question back. It's not so much a question, but just, you know, to kind of reemphasize that, is that the law doesn't say it needs to be a medical provider. Plus, it needs to be somebody that's familiar with the disability and yeah. vouch for it. So it might be somebody's mom, or it might be somebody's uncle, if they're familiar with the disability. Yeah, the, the comment in the back was it doesn't necessarily need to be a medical provider. Uh, it needs to be a reliable third party who is in the position to know. So when the when the challenges are coming in on it, they're either are, are they in a position to know or are they reliable? Uh, you know, my brother has a disability. I've, I'm familiar with a lot of the limitations that it imposes on him. If for some reason uh, he was unable to contact anybody else in the universe and needed me to write a proof of need for him, I could probably do it for some aspects of his disability, not for others. And hey, you know, I'm a lawyer. I am bound by my ethical code only to tell the truth in writing. So if you got something from a lawyer, maybe it's worth considering as reliable. That's I, not true. <laughs> maybe you have a Sometimes not, right? <laughs> maybe yeah. you have a different ethical code in Utah. I just, I'm not a lot of people, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> 
We may have met some of the same people. <laughs> we agree, yeah. Yeah, okay, That's right. question in the back. True, true. What if they eat the animal before they have that like, group of meat? Can we require them to not have the animal in the dwelling until they have that group of meat? Okay, question is... Yeah, question is, what if they get the animal first and then get the proof of need for it? Um, so a proof of need can be retroactive. Um, we have, uh, we did have some federal cases a while back in New York uh, where uh, the housing provider's process to get an animal uh, approved was such a pain in the butt uh, that people didn't follow through with it. Uh, and so, you know, they had already been talking to their medical providers, the medical providers had already said, yeah, go ahead and do this. Um, but because it was such a pain to go through all the hoops of getting it approved, they didn't bother to do it until the landlord showed up and filed an eviction notice against them for having the unauthorized animal. At which point they came back and said, hey, here's my retroactive proof of need showing that I needed this all along. And uh, the court's opinion on this is, well, yeah, if they needed it all along, then uh, it's very possible uh, that it should have been considered that way all along. Now, a lot of people who write proof of needs don't necessarily write them in a way where it's clear whether they are retroactive or not. Um, generally work from the date listed on the earliest proof of need that you have, but some of them might say, uh, you know, this person has been in treatment since this date, and since this date uh, we have recommended uh, an animal. Uh, any other thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I think it's also important because some people, I we have had clients that have had service animals all along no matter where they've lived and so they just quite being quite educated do they didn't have to provide a proof of need until it was requested so they move in they have their animal and they they have it ready to go um, so there's that too or there's sometimes when they've transitioned where they the, do, the doctor will recommend it and it doesn't have to be a doctor but they'll recommend it after the fact that they're going yeah that that is working for you and they're like well you know i'm going to go do some other things to help them and to have them and they have to, they can be individually trained have them trained to do some other things for me you know because they were victimized or something like that or something happened to them and help them walk or help them pull their their um, wheelchair they use every so often. And so there's things where there's intervening things that happen. And I just think it's always good to have that interactive dialogue and not just go in and, you know, eviction or say you have to do this, but have that dialogue without inquiring in the nature and severity because we don't want to end up like the East River case. We want to have, you know, good landlord tenant relationships so that people are forthright about it once they know that they should they should ask for or ask for a proof of need or provide it. Or um it's probably not a good idea to say uh, up front deny the use of the animal until you find out. It's better to err on the side of caution for a couple of reasons uh, that, you know, it turns out maybe retroactively they should have had the animal and that can tick people off and they can file complaints with us. Uh, but the other thing too is to delay, as, as Mike pointed out earlier, can also be a violation uh, of the Americans with, Dis with Disabilities Act because they didn't get their accommodation in time. You know, so there's a lot of problems with, uh, again, not committing the error on the side of caution. Okay, uh, got a few more questions. I'll go to the next slide and then see if they address any of that. <laughs> so here are some things that are okay to do. Uh, it is okay to bill somebody for damages caused by an animal um, in the same way that you would bill them for damages that they personally caused. Um, it is okay to require the residents to have a plan for dealing with animal waste. I have phrased that very carefully um, because if you have a disability that means you cannot physically uh, do the pooping scooping yourself, um, you can say, all right, we'll come up with some other way to make sure that said poop gets scooped. Um, and it is okay to require an animal to be reasonably well behaved. Um, if your rule is that a dog can never bark, um, or if your rule is that a cat can never jump on a couch, um, then you are probably not really familiar with how dogs or cats work. Um, a rule like that is so restrictive as to essentially be a denial. But you can require the animals to be reasonably well behaved. Um, if there is some question about what is reasonable behavior for a particular animal, make sure you explain in writing why you think it's reasonable. Okay, questions popping up again. Gail. So I have a question, but I, I have an interesting case that I'm investigating. A woman has a, no, 
emotional support animal, and there's an area where they said that the pets, can, not the pets, but the pet, emotional support animals can go take care of the business. Well, in the meantime, if she's taking her pet, their emotional support animal to that area, if it happens to go to the bathroom prior to that, they've been writing her up yeah. and disciplining her. The nature of a dog is such that you cannot make them hold it if they really have to at a particular one time. And so, you know, really is, they do say, look, we have this key area, they say, okay, but really, it's the nature of the dog as it going to make it there the whole time. So that's, you know, yeah, so the comment is about the reasonability of dedicated pee and poop areas. Um, for some animals, it may be reasonable. For others, it may not. Um, I had some other questions over here. Uh, my question had to do with uh, not being able to, uh, not accepting specific species or specific breeds. Some cities have, like Pocatello, you can't have a rooster, for example, right? But say somebody has a rooster and they come to, you know, can you, as can the landlord, say that's against city code? You'll have to talk to the city, and until they get back, they make a determination. It's it's a no, or do you err on the side of caution and say bring your rooster or your pit bull for other cities? I guess. Uh, and yeah. Tell, and, and we'll let it stay here until they make a determination. Yeah, so the question is, if you're in the position where the person needs to apply for an accommodation from somebody else, like a city ordinance, or from an insurance company, what do you do while you're waiting for the accommodation to be granted? Um, thoughts? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to err on the side. I'm going to say the same thing that Lauren did. I, I would err on the side of, you know, temporary permission. You're going to allow them in to have the animal. They still have to have, you know, reasonableness is care and control. So if they're, uh, you know, cockadoodle doing, you know, at, that could be problematic, um, and so that may not be reasonable, right? Um, but if they're out in the country, you're renting something out in the country and it's prohibited, you know, it's still within city limits, that might be reasonable. And so I, I have to look at facts and circumstances of that particular request. If it's a if it's a pit bull, that ship has sailed. They're, they've city of Payette already got sued over that and they lost. And there's other cities across the country that have lost on those banned breeds um, and insurance companies that limit, have breed restrictions. They've already lost on that issue. Of course, you can address if, if a dog or any animal is aggressive um, and, uh, you know, behaves that way to anyone, then you have to take you have to take steps to address that right away. And we have kind of a, and I'm sure Lauren does as well, a progressive kind of uh, remediation process that needs to be that needs to be addressed so that they have an opportunity to address that animal's behavior, make sure that everyone else is safe, and on top of that, possibly look for another animal. If, but if the, sometimes people don't want to, then you give them time to, to have the animal removed if they're a danger to the, to the property, and also giving them time to decide, are they gonna move with that animal wherever they're gonna move with that animal to, or are they gonna stay and find an alternative um, assistance animal. So those are the kind of things that you want to make sure you address them right away and get help when they're complicated. Lauren, do you want to? Yeah, I would absolutely. I would suggest you grant the temporary accommodation and let them know that they need to seek that accommodation request through the city. And then when the lawsuit comes, it's against the city and not against you. But the city's great, so we won't, right? No, but you <laughs> tell them they're outsourced. <laughs> Not this city, no. <laughs> I have a question about the insurance accommodation. If, if an insurance accommodation is required and it raises the premium, who's responsible? Yeah. So um, HUD did issue guidance on that. This is really great because HUD issued guidance on reasonable accommodations and modifications. And HUD issued guidance on, on whether it, it's a burden if there is no other insurance um, that it might not be reasonable, or if you can't find some other alternative, then it might not be reasonable. But you, as a housing provider, say, hey, I would grant this, and I'm going to approve it, but I can't find insurance anywhere else. You get you, so Kate says, gets you off the hook, hopefully, because usually it does, and Lauren can speak to that. I don't, that has been my experience. But then the insurance company, and we had a case like this, is on the hook still. For that fair housing complaint because they have a policy that is discriminatory that caused the housing provider to incur an unreasonable cost because of their request for that that particular type of breed because guess what a lot of uh, animals for sight impairments are what 
German Shepherds. Shepherds. What's on the breed restriction list? German Shepherds. German Shepherds. It is amazing sometimes. And, you know, there those are the kinds of things where insurance policies are typically at the top level changed, but sometimes the brokers at the at the you know the local level are still using old policies and procedures that unfortunately get that company in trouble. So those are some things where you go and you have that exchange, the housing provider, and I'll tell you we've represented the owner of a property, a property manager, the the tenants that live there, all the people that live there with them because it was a, a hospice home. All of them, all of them were complainants in our case because all of them complied with the Fair Housing Act. We won't talk about the HOA. The HOA wasn't how we met Lauren because she's great, um, but did the thing that was naughty. You that know? HOA did not hire Lauren's firm. They did not hire we Lauren. Had they, they hired Lauren, stuff, hire me. right? They it's way too late. <laughs> um, but those are the kind of things where everybody along the way did the right thing, and we all, all of us together, could not convince the other party. And that happens with, you know, it might happen with the insurance company, and that's why, you know, asking these questions are super important. So. Okay. I a question back. saw another question back here. Yeah. Um, I just wondered if you, like, if you have a service dog that bites, or I mean, maybe not a service dog, a, um, yeah. 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 <laughs> who can we come to you and say, okay, what's the mediation process here? What do we do to remediate this? And what recourse does the owner have? Does the, the landowner have? Okay. Uh, question is, what happens if the support animal bites somebody? Um, the fact that a, a support animal has gone and bitten somebody has immediately made it a lot less reasonable to keep this animal around. Um, this may this is probably the time when you document this incident thoroughly to make sure that you know, remember, remember the gossip problem. We want to make sure that uh, this is not just uh, people playing mean girls with each other, uh, trying to get rid of somebody's dog. That you know, we have documentation of the bite. That we can explain what happened, and then say, hey, you know, what can we do here uh, to ensure that your animal is not going to bite everybody again? I, I am open to your suggestions, and uh, I. I don't care if you have to muzzle it, uh, if we have to replace it with a different animal, uh, but we've got to do something to keep our other tenants from getting hurt. And that, so it says oh, it's okay to require an animal to be well behaved. Yeah. Biting yeah. is not well behaved. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And Lauren, Very you, few bites in the Westminster Dog Show. They refuse. They refuse to do any of that. Yeah, then, then I'm going to say that in our case where our, if our client has, has not, is not agreeing with that, then because they have documented that it, I'm gonna just go assume some facts here because I don't have, we don't have all the facts. I'm gonna assume that that dog did it. I'm gonna assume that there's indications the dog would do it again and all those things and that even though they removed it and they muzzled it, that I don't have assurance that that animal, that any kind of training or remediation is going to be reasonable, that they're not going to be compliant. Then we would suggest to our client that you need to either you need to move with the animal if you're not wanting to to stay there or find another animal and most of the time I'll just tell you because they're so bonded with that animal that they will choose to move with the animal Lauren do you want to or Rick do you want to suggest yeah so having dealt with several of the bite cases hands down I think that your best option is to involve animal control because they are, the, they are the entity that should be dealing with aggressive dogs. Yep. They are the ones that should be making decisions about whether that dog can be rehabilitated. And you know, you really probably don't have you know the skill set to step in and know with the training of the dog. Um, you probably can't watch 100% of the time to make sure that every time that dog is going out, it's muzzled. Um, I think it takes a lot of the pressure off of you to make those hard calls and really puts that that responsibility with animal control to to do the job that they're trained to do so that would be my go-to in our process the idaho human rights commission um, if that tenant brought a complaint to us we would investigate it as a neutral party and so what would end up happening before it got to a stage where it might be litigated or you know handed along I, I'm not sure the ins and outs of how it goes to HUD after that and so forth. But uh, we would do a neutral investigation and it could very, very well come down to 
say all things being considered, it may well come down to a no-cause finding for discrimination. So they're going to take that away from it. But I do want to emphasize that that our process, both in the investigation and in mediation, is going to be a neutral process. We're not going to advocate for either party. Unless a cause finding is found, that's a different thing, which I won't go into. <laughs> but the thing is, is that if they're, in that case, you know, we're going to be weighing all those facts. If the dog bit somebody and that's established, I really having trouble figuring out how that would be a cause case. Yeah. So there's that, there's our process too to go with that. And I think, I agree with, I agree with Warren that most of the time, best practices, if someone's come with, to us and said, you know, animal control was called, you know, you're going to listen to because they are the experts on animal behavior and, and you know, you need to take the remediation steps. And it's hard because you have to tell people things that maybe they don't want to hear, but it's for the safety, not only of them, but for the community. So there's another reason to involve animal control. The animal may already have an established history, of course, and that would weigh in. Mm -hmm. So that would be another reason to notify them, because if the animal is bitten already once, and it's happened a second time, then that's a serious issue. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, okay, so it's on damages to an animal. Okay. Whether it's companion or a service. If you have a tenant that has an animal, and that animal has caused expensive damage, can you, and you know it's going to exceed their deposit, can you ask, can you start asking for money for that? damage uh, to be out. So the question is, during the tenancy, if a resident's assistance animal causes damage that is greater than the amount of their deposit, uh, can you start uh, enforcing uh, your damage claim then, or do you have to wait until after they leave? Um, so we treat this like damage uh, caused any other way uh, during uh, your tenancy. So is that something you normally do uh, if a tenant just you know, has a wild party and wrecks all their stuff uh, during tenancy? If so, uh, then you can do it the same way. If not, then don't do it that way. So, so I, I don't know, Lauren can su suggest how, she, how they address it or Rick. If you, have a, if you have a written lease agreement, and the written lease agreement typically, if someone does damage, you have in there that you can't damage the apartment, right? Don't look at, don't look at it as they're disabled and their animal caused this. Look at it as did the occupant damage the property? And if they damage the property, you're going to follow your, your due process procedures. You're going to go to the rules and you're going to say, hey, when you damage the property, the lease says or the state law says I can give you a three-day notice of compliance, or if your guide says some of you are federal subsidy subsidized providers and you have a a violation of a progressive policy, dis, progressive discipline policy, where you say I'm going to first give you a warning, and if you don't correct it, I'm going to give you a second warning that says if you haven't already corrected the damage, then I'm going to give you the notice that is stated in this rule or stated under state law, right? And if they say, oh, I need a reasonable accommodation, you will listen to that and say, well, can I, sometimes the accommodations, they'll come to us and I'll have to say, yeah, you, they have evidence and it's pretty good. And I go, we visit it and sure enough, and I, we don't focus on the disability. We don't focus that they had children. We don't focus that whatever the protected class is. If they have damage, we go, okay, guess what? This is truly damaged. We look at the move-in inspection. We look at what was was all great when they moved in. And guess what? You need to start making, and they'll ask for reasonable accommodation to make installment payments because maybe the only way that they get um, money is through you know their SSI check or whatever, or they have to get a grant to help them pay for it. But those are some things where follow your due process policies, follow what are in your rules, follow what is state law. Make sure you give notice. You're giving them an opportunity to correct their bad practices, right? Their bad behavior. Focus on the behavior of what they've done, not the protected status. Does that make sense? But document it, okay? Lauren, do you have, or Rick, do you have suggestions? Yeah, the only other thing I would add is that even if you do have a policy, a written policy or rules for addressing that damage, even if you're following with that tenant, make sure that you're enforcing it with everybody else because it is a real problem when you say, well, this tenant's been violating all these rules, so I've been enforcing, and I look and go, okay, well, here are all your other rules. What about that violation and that violation and that violation, and it turns out that the housing provider isn't enforcing? 
yep. even when they have a written policy. So whatever you are doing with everyone else, do it, do it with that individual too. Yeah, there yeah. are a lot of places that'll sell form leases that are like 50 pages long that have things in them that will, you know, theoretically ban everything in the universe. And the problem with uh, something like that is that if you're not prepared uh, to enforce all of those terms evenly, you're setting yourself up for a point where you're saying, okay, the, the terms that are, uh, you know, these terms are being used more frequently against people of protected classes A, B, and C, uh, whereas people who are not of these protected classes are doing all these other things that are against the lease and they're not getting uh, uh, they're not getting penalized for it. Uh, so next slide. Question we always get, well, what if I think it's a scam? Um, so the American way of medicine is uh, for the person who has some sort of disability uh, to find out about a treatment first and then get curious about whether they want it. They're, they're, you know, they're watching the prices right and Wilford Brimley comes on and tells them about uh, treatment for diabetes and they think, well, maybe I should ask somebody about that. So uh, if somebody has a disability that may be helped by an animal, they think, oh, I, what do I do to find out about this? Well, they put it into Google. And you know, your first 10 search results on Google for assistance animal or support animal or stuff are all gonna, they're often gonna be the places online that'll sell you the letter uh, no matter who you are. And they may not know that they can already get this information from the people they're already getting treatment from. Um, so they may just go online too. So it's very possible that they're getting hustled in this situation as much as you are. Um, remember that we're going back to reliable third party in a position to know. Um, so if you get the feeling that one of these is coming from you know, guaranteedanimal.com, um, be able to document it. Um, like, there's nothing that stops you from looking at uh, the name on the proof of need form and putting it into Google and putting the name of the therapy group into Google and looking it up and going to their website. And then if you see on their website that it's saying, you know, basically the only thing we do here is recommend uh, assistance animals and it's starting and looking at more and more pages on the site start to indicate that boy, these guys may not be reliable and or in a position of no, to know, you go to the website and you take screenshots of the website. And then you put it in your file and then you write back and say, hey, you know, I had a look at this medical provider. I went to the website. I looked at all this stuff. And, you know, based on that, I have some real concerns about the reliability of this particular provider. Um, are you already working with somebody else? Do you have... Uh, do you have a medical professional you're already seeing? Are you working with a social worker? Are you working with a counselor? Um, you know, maybe for the next week or so, I'll let it slide until you can get your next appointment. Uh, talk, you know, talk over uh, the possibility of animal treatment uh, with a reliable provider who is in a position to know who is probably the person you're already seeing. Lauren, do you wanna, or are you gonna talk about it more? You know, I was gonna address it a little bit more this afternoon, but, um, it is becoming a really a really hot topic, and there have been some knockdown, drag out fights over <laughs> Sir to Pet, and yeah. you know it, it cuts both ways. I think it it hurts people with disabilities to have you know places out there that will give you essentially a diagnosis yes. with a money back guarantee. That's a problem yeah. for people who truly do need um, assistance animals, and it's a problem for housing providers when they cannot really verify that reliable information. So I guess we'll talk about it too later. Yeah. I, I look at it as you, I, I, when someone comes in and they brought an online form in or someone has called me, I look at it and go, to me, one, you didn't need to do that unless it's a really, a truly a, tele a telecommuting doctor. And we have those. I mean, I have a friend that goes down to the Mayo Clinic um, and that is their main medical provider. Um, so that would be a reliable party. And they may exchange information over the computer and may get things that would be a reasonable accommodation. And that would be something that Lauren and I probably wouldn't question or Mike. But there may be times when someone has brought me in, like Mike has said, and I, think I looked at Lauren's examples, a form and I'll say, okay, well that to me is like a reasonable accommodation request. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is go clarify, we're gonna get a proof of need. So you're gonna go, 
like Mike said, go to someone who can verify that you have a disability under the Fair Housing Act and that you need this animal to use and enjoy the dwelling. And that is what, that, that I think is best practice for someone who's coming to me. And if they come back and they have that, then that is something they're gonna go share with the, the housing provider or if we're talking with a, a lawyer or the property manager or the owner, then that's the thing that we do. But that makes it more, that's best practices. And that's something that I think uh, is a better practice than sometimes people get scammed and they do silly things and some people are engaging in behavior that is not beneficial and hurts people with disabilities and either way it's not good so yeah um so i've had a couple of other questions on um things that uh people have used in the past to say that medical providers or whoever may not be reliable that feels to me like they have come from an alternate universe where uh, doctors and counselors and so forth behave in a different way uh, like we have had some people say well um the person here made the recommendation at, after only having one appointment with them. Um, I have been in many situations where I have gone to see a doctor or a medical provider or somebody else for the first time, and after the first appointment, they made a recommendation for me. You know, I go in for uh, physical last year, I meet the PA for the first time, I say, oh, you know, I'm having back spasms. He says, great, here's your, uh, you know, here's your muscle relaxant. Um, so the fact that uh, they only had, they made this recommendation at the very first appointment isn't necessarily a sign that it's, uh, that it's not re reliable. Others have said, well, um, we tried to contact the medical provider and uh, I tried to speak with this provider, uh, but they didn't get back to me, so it's probably not reliable. <coughs> medical providers are super busy. Uh, it is really hard to get them to talk on the phone. Like this has been, this has been a running joke since like the 1950s that the only way you could speak to your doctor was to tackle him on the golf course. Uh, <laughs> so that's not necessarily a sign that it's unreliable. If you're looking at whether or not somebody's a reliable third party, I suggest you know if they are a if they are really trying to hustle people, uh, then it's going to be clear from their website. Uh, and all their advertising, because they're gonna be doing advertising, that that's what they're doing. So get screenshots of it and keep it as documentation. Any more questions on this issue? And Lauren's gonna follow up on it. Yeah. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. All right, moving li right along. Uh, we've discussed this before. Um, if you want to allow the animal in, uh, but there's an HOA rule or a city ordinance or an insurance policy or you know an angry neighbor, who's trying to stop you from allowing the animal. Uh, now the first three you can get accommodations from because they're housing providers. The fourth one, if the neighbor is getting in your way, um, they are committing harassment based on disability. Uh, it's no different than if they had uh, come to you and said, uh, I don't want black people living near me. Um, and in all those cases, you are a person who is associated uh, with the person who has been discriminated against uh, because you are their housing provider. Um, you have the potential of losing money, of losing a good tenant, of losing a good reputation in the community because of their actions towards you. And so not only does your resident get a claim, but you can file a fair housing claim as well. Yes? Um, you talk about the neighbor. As say like for instance, like if one of the neighbors around you call um, the dog catcher and is consistently going to that home and um, of course they don't have to reveal who was calling, but would that be a harassment? Is that, what, where, where does that tenant go? Okay, so the question what? is, uh, do you want to keep talking? Or, okay. Uh, question is, uh, what if people could keep calling animal control uh, to go after a, an assistance animal when there's not really any reason for animal control to get involved? Uh, that sounds to me very much like uh, if neighbors kept stealing their wheelchair, right? So they are harassing somebody based on a thing that they need for their disability. Um, so, uh, as a housing provider, uh, you should do a harassment investigation, which Lauren will talk about later, I'm sure. Um, and uh, if you 
if you get to the bottom of who is behind this, um, then make sure uh, those residents are aware that they have got to knock it off or uh, they're, they're gone. And they can be subject to uh, fair housing complaints, the same as if, uh, the same as if you know, black people moved into the neighborhood and the neighbors started putting Confederate flags in their windows. So does the animal have to be a service animal? What if it's um, a pet? Yes. OK, so what if it's a pet? Um, is the pet being targeted because of, of the owner's protected class? Is this only happening to pets of uh, Latinos? Is this only happening to uh, pets of uh, people who are Catholic? Is it only happening to pets of men? Uh, if so, then you may be able to tie it in with one of the protected classes. Uh, otherwise, um, it's probably not falling into a protected class. It's just tenants being jerks to each other, and you handle that with your usual tenants being jerks procedures. It's also, um, Zoe or Lisa was mentioning that, you know, if there is a misuse of of the the uh, animal control, there might be city or state laws of making false reports. So there are other ways that the city or the county or whomever is being complained to can address those things too, if it doesn't fall under the Fair Housing Act. So there might be both that and the Fair Housing Act if it's based on a protected class. So that's important. I think it's really important that if you are a housing provider or let's say an HOA or something of that nature, we had a, we had a family that had moved into an apartment complex that was African and the next door neighbor kept kept saying, thought that they didn't speak English very well and kept making bigoted mark, remarks to the family and would kept calling the police. And the police, the first time, unfortunately, made a mistake of not getting an interpreter. And when you're federally funded under Title VI, you're required to provide an interpreter. So they, they did, finally. And when they went to investigate, they found out the accusation was that they were playing their TV too loud, they were playing their radio too loud, all these things. Well, the family didn't have any of those things. And thank goodness, because the police did a very thorough investigation, and they had some intervening civil rights training. I won't tell you where that came from, but they had some intervening civil rights training. And when they kept, when they kept coming back, they kept documenting, so they had really great reports. But what kept happening is the the landlord didn't go the landlord didn't go investigate to see what was going on between the two neighbors and so this this neighbor was harassing this neighbor because they were prejudiced towards them because they were black and because they were african and so they kept making these comments and one time when if had to had the landlord investigated after each time the tenants would go forward and say move us please move us or they bring an interpreter and say please move us and every time that they made a report there was some documentation, either the report, they were neither there, because one time the lady, the, the woman was in the hospital, had just given birth. One time she was over with uh, her sister, having the baby be taken care of, and the, the husband was um, working, and they could document all this. And guess what happened? If you don't investigate, which I'm sure you know, Lauren is going to say, investigate everything, investigate both sides because you want to make sure you investigate it and you document it and you do something because not only will you as a property manager be liable if you're allowing tenants to harass each other, but the owner of that property was, was liable. And in fact, in that property in and of itself, when we unfortunately couldn't resolve it through mediation and then through conciliation um, with HUD, and it goes to federal court, a lot of people who were investors in that property we're very, very upset with the way that it, that it was addressed by the property management company. And so it's really good best practices. If the, the person who's complaining says this and they don't like Lauren said with the animal control, if they don't, you don't go and get those police reports and take a look at what's happening and the police reports are corroborating the family that's being harassed, you know, that, that can be a problem. And so that's the same kind of thing as Mike's discussing. If every single time you've got neighbor on neighbor or tenant on tenant harassment, and someone who ever has control over that, if you're renting both properties, you as the housing provider have control. If you own one and then there's another landlord, you probably should call the other landlord because that person's affecting, you're, you're affected by it and they're affected by it to give, put them on notice. Also the city, if the city comes and they're documenting something and, and it may feel like the city's harassing them as well. We're not, sorry, we're not blaming the city here. Um, and the city is not, is keeps coming even though this person's making false reports then they, there may be a civil rights action against the city for harassment if it's based on a protected class. So those are some things to be careful about. Okay. Yeah. Can I make a quick point? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> everybody belongs in a protected class. 
you know everybody has a protected class it's risky to assume that one might not now if we you called with that or whoever was called with that complaint the from the example you gave our job would be to try identify if there was a protected class that caused this harassment and you know if there was a we would take it of course but the fact is is it's not a real long path to find a protected class somebody could literally say i'm an old guy you know a old white guy and they're calling on my pet because i'm an old white guy it, it, it could be like that i'm an old white guy i can say that see so the point being is that uh, you know it's a it's a risky thing to harass somebody that way but we would identify that protected class uh, uh, if there was one if there's not one i think mike's point is very well taken yeah you go to the uh, terrible neighbor guys and have them take care whatever that yeah. is yeah look for the pattern yeah if you're seeing the pattern where it's happening mostly to men or it's happening mostly to somebody of a certain race or it's happening mostly to people of a certain religion then you should start to be suspicious I think, I think you had a question. <laughs> it has been answered. Excellent. More than an hour. <laughs> All right. We can it on. Okay. Did you hear about the peacock on the airplane? <laughs> yes, I did hear about the peacock on the airplane. Um, so airplanes follow different rules, number one. Uh, they are covered by a different set of rules. Um, I have never had a case where anybody has asked for a peacock as a companion animal. We have generally seen domestic animals, uh, mostly cats and dogs, occasionally a lizard, you know, turtle, uh, uh, you know, mice, rats, uh, sometimes like a pot-bellied pig, which, you know, are un not very common domestic animals, but they are domestic animals. Um, and a yak. Yak. And a yak now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yak. I, here's the thing. <laughs> Much like peacocks, I don't know anything about yaks. I know they're big and they come from Asia. Um, so I don't know whether somebody needs a yak. And I don't know if somebody needs a peacock. Because their doctor and their counselor knows more about them than I do. And they're smarter than me because they went into doctoring and counseling instead of being a lawyer, which is the worst job in the world. <laughs> we love it. So it's hard for me I, looking at the story of the peacock on the airplane, I can think, boy, that's unusual. But I'm really not in a position to say whether or not that person actually needed that peacock or whether they were trying to scam the airline. I just don't know. And the, the lesson we can take away from this is a lot of times um, we, it's, we have a temptation to kind of believe that we know a lot of things that we don't actually know a lot of, uh, about. Uh, it's uh, what they call unconscious incompetence, that you don't really know what you're doing, and you don't know that you don't know what you're doing, so you think you know everything. Uh, like the first time you look down at the ski hill and think, boy, that looks easy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so when we're looking at animals, we may look at it and think, oh, you know, there's no way that uh, this animal can possibly do this thing. But maybe it can because we're you know, property managers and we're lawyers and we're uh, all these other kinds of people um, who is, you know, this is not our primary subject of expertise and maybe we're wrong. And the Internet is not always right. Right. The Internet's not always right. <laughs> I thought all this stuff on the Internet. I've been Sorry, to Sorry to burst your bubble. Uh, but, but Lauren will explain the yak, right, later, hopefully. No. Yeah. Yes, I've okay. got it all We're going to save, save the Don't yak. worry. We have a yakologist coming yakologist. in. And we'll yak about that we'll later. Yeah. Oh. There we go. Woo! <laughs> He's flung. contagious. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but I, it's one of those things, again, if you had the peacock, and Lauren and, and Rick and Mike can jump in, if you had the peacock, you probably have a rule regarding exotic animals. Most most cities, states have some sort of exotic animal ordinance, and you know you're going to go through the same process, right? If it's not obvious, you're going to get a proof of need. I don't think that would be an obvious thing. Then you're going to go through the next thing of, is it regulated by city, city, county, state ordinance? You're going to ask for an accommodation because what might happen? Those regulated animal control may come, and so, right, and so you want to make sure you're in compliance. 
you want to make sure all the things that, based on the facts and circumstances, make it reasonable. Okay, and I can sincerely say we have not had the peacock. So when that first came out, I actually did think it was a, not serious. I, but go ahead. Whose responsibility is it to, uh, to ask for those accommodations? Would it be the resident or the county manager? Uh, so the question. The city or yeah. county. Yeah, uh, question is if the accommodation needs to come from somebody other than uh, the housing provider who asked for it, the housing provider or the resident. Uh, generally, it's going to be the resident because they're in the best position to get the proof of need. Um, because it would be really weird if you went directly to somebody's doctor and said, hey, tell me if this dude is disabled or not. Um, so it's generally going to be um, the the resident, uh, there's nothing that stops you uh, if you really like this resident from submitting a, a letter along with it saying, uh, you know, we've got a time crunch here. It's very important to me uh, that you get a uh, resolution on this. If you if you know uh, the person's animal and can personally vouch for it and say, yeah, this is a, uh, I have no worries that uh, this, this yak or whatever is going to cause problems in my community, there's no reason why you can't submit that as evidence of reasonableness when they are trying to make their decision. And we do see that a lot of housing providers will, um, because they want to be in compliance to show that they also, they're like, well, we approved it, but whatever governmental body has said no, then they have come in and helped them. And I think that's really good because that protects you as a housing provider or an owner or HOA or whatever it is that's a developer. So those that's good to have, I think. Yeah. And it's not just for compliance, but uh, sometimes it's because you don't want to lose a good resident. That's right. Um, it, because they are hard to find. And if somebody has, uh, has been excellent about everything, you don't want some other jerk coming in here and making you lose your good tenant uh, so that you have to go find somebody else who might not be as good. So, uh, Zoe had a question. Can I ask it? Yeah. Right. If, if, it's, if, if, if you think it's pertinent. Any questions yeah. are good. Yeah. It says, can you do a background check with animal control or a reference check on an animal? And I got another one on that, too, so we'll ask it. Uh, so is that like a, is it physically possible to do this thing, or is this? No, it, is it acceptable it for you to do it? Is it acceptable? If you have a suspicion yeah. that this animal could have been a problem previously because of its size, breed, whatever, then is it reasonable for you and it's acceptable for you to check with animal control and see if there is a record for this animal? I would be cautious about doing it only for certain types of animals um, because okay. the argument there is, You're well, if you, yeah, if you have a disability that requires a, a cat, then you are in a better position than if you, are in a dis, if you have a disability that requires a dog. Um, if there is, um, you know, if that's going to be part of your regular documentation, um, I couldn't think of any reason why it would be particularly uh, bad to do it. Don't pass the fee along to the resident uh, because that would be a fee associated with their disability. Right. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, and then I'll, I'm sure you guys have comments. Um, I also would make sure that when you do a background check anyway, so you do a criminal background check, if there has been an animal citation for vicious animals, it usually comes up. And that would be possibly a red flag, of course. And then that might be something to say, is this the animal in this particular instance? And then you need to work through that. If they say yes, then it may not be reasonable. And if it's not, then it, it is probably reasonable unless you need to ask for a proof of need, which they probably have already provided. A reference check, again, if you do background check, if you're asking other housing providers, if you actually do landlord checks, right? A lot of times I'll have a policy where they don't share information, but sometimes they will have a policy where they will, they paid rent on time, they complied with all the rules, blah, blah, blah. They're being fair housing providers. They may say, yes, we had, a, they had a violation lease. They may not say why, but there may be something else that a screener picks up that there was some sort of issue like an animal citation. I'm not saying that that is always revealed because also, you know, landlords don't want to get in trouble for sharing information unless it's accurate on how it's portrayed. Um, so those are some things that I know when people do background checks, they do look at those things and sometimes this information comes up and that way it's something you do for everyone regardless, regardless of their protected status, not just for people with uh, service or assistance animals. Anyway. I mean, 
I agree with them both wholeheartedly. I think the only time you should be running these animal background checks ahead of time is either, you know, if you're doing it for everybody, always. Yeah. And if you actually have some, you know, reliable suspicion that this animal has been aggressive, whether it's a prior landlord report, maybe maybe it growls and kind of lunges at you when you mm -hmm. greet this tenant. I think then you have a basis to, to investigate whether this animal is going to be a reasonable accommodation, but I certainly would not do it based on breed or size. Okay. All right, uh, we've got uh, about 10 minutes for more questions if people want to ask 10 minutes worth of questions, uh, or even fewer. Yes? Um, so earlier you, like, talking about what the law is and as far as the animal background checks, um, and you said that you would Okay, so uh, the question is, uh, the person is a professional property manager um, who also owns a separate uh, unit. That's not uh, managed by the property. Right, that is not managed by the property management company. Um, you are in kind of a weird spot because on the one hand, you would normally fall under this exception. Uh, but on the other hand, the act says it, pro it applies to people who are in the business of housing. So on the other hand, you are, um, you know, you are a housing provider at your day job. Um, I would le I would lean towards unlikely um, because um, the, the the small landlord provision is designed mostly for, uh, a lot for people who are kind of managing property, properties on the side and have a day job that they derive more of their income from. And it sounds like you're more in that position than in the other one, but uh, there's a small chance that you might be covered. I would say that situation you, you wouldn't save you a lot of trouble because we would take a case and then we would make a, a decision on jurisdiction. Uh, so. You know, it'd still be out there. It wouldn't automatically exempt you from, say, a charge. So no, also, oh, sorry. No, that's it. Um, and Laura may speak to this too. But we're going to talk about advertising after making public statements. Mm -hmm. So even if it didn't, let's say you didn't, you weren't a property manager, but you made this public statement that you don't take anybody with an emotional support animal. That might be a discriminatory statement. Right. It might right. Go back to right. The property management company also because I could have made that on their behalf. Yes. The person could have seen it as me making that comment on the property management company's behalf rather than just my own. But even in your own, let's say, let's say, let's not use ESA. Let's say you you don't have the property management company, OK? You have, right, I'm just, you have one unit, have two one units. Unit. Yeah. And you're renting them out, and you say, no children, no, no whatever, no ESAs. That, well, no, 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 but I'm giving you an example. Right. But let's say you're not regularly, you don't regularly fall under the Fair Housing Act in that way. Mm -hmm. You always do in making a public statement. If you make a discriminatory statement and you, in fact, then act on that discriminatory statement, mm -hmm. you may be found to have violated the Fair Housing Act by that published statement. Verbal, in writing, advertising. So it's best to not do that. I'm not saying that in this specific case that you may not, you may be able to um, choose who you are allowed to have, but if you're making a public statement and then acting on it, you may be discriminating. And the weird thing about this one is, is the overlap between you have, you have yours, which is separate, but you also act as a property manager. So, and Lauren maybe can speak to it. She's maybe addressed this. I would, I would wholeheartedly fight for the side that you are not a housing provider under the act in owning one or two units. Mm -hmm. Certainly as you know, a property manager, as an agent making those housing decisions, you're definitely responsible. But I, I think that even to have the discriminatory statement portions of the act apply, you would have to be a housing provider not exempt from the act. Well, I, I so, I mean, clearly, don't say big oh, and things. Let, right. I'm not endorsing yeah. that at all. Um, yeah. You will. But. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I am renting out the spare room in my condo, and I always 
terrified yeah. of but doing But you had an this. exemption. Did you talk about the Mrs. Mr. Murphy yeah. exemption? Yeah, uh, I am renting out a room uh, in a space where I also live. So I am more exempt uh, from the person who is renting out properties where they don't live. Uh, that said, I was still super scared that people would, would like, hey, he's the fair housing guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're more than fair. <laughs> but he can't make discriminatory statements. And I, yeah. I, 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 I just would be careful. You may, you may file with HUD, I agree with Lauren, you may file with HUD, or you may go to court, and nothing happens, but that expense, and I'm not saying that you can't pick and choose, you know, but you need to be reasonable about picking and choosing such that you're not making a public statement because you will get, I'm gonna say this, I'm not saying to try to get away with it, I'm saying the spirit of the Fair Housing Act was so, and the uh, Human Rights Act is that you, we include everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Otherwise, it costs society more if people are not housed. There's right. also so, the don't get you in the wash, they get you in the rinse principle. Absolutely. But you got to watch out. Well, I can do this in Idaho, or I can do this because I'm exempt, and then do something else that HUD enforces or is not exempt. I, th I think there's a wonderful argument about what you do with the advertising. But, you know, you're not, that, that's, that simple fact of an exemption may not protect you. So it's worth keeping that in mind anytime. Yeah. Okay, so question is, uh, this person is a property manager who is living at a uh, property that she does not manage. Uh, she got a, uh, a list of ESA rules uh, that uh, say that the proof of need has to come from a medical provider, and apparently if you have an ESA at this complex, they go through once a week for cleaning inspections, including like a black light. <laughs> Holy crap! <laughs> Yeah, that is, quite possibly. yeah, like this is uh, no, I, I may be able to guess who your property manager meant. Don't guess. Who the company is? I won't Don't do guess. it here. This is, this is um, being that said, um, we have found that uh, property managers are often uh, the best people to report violations because they are familiar with what's happening. Um, so. If Let's this analyze is, it, though. Yeah, so... Best um, practices. So, number one, uh, requirement that the letter come from a doctor. What do you all think of that? No. No, no. it's not required. It's not, that's not the requirement. No, it's a uh, reliable third party in a position to know. That's often a doctor. Often it isn't. And I do want to put this yeah. My intention is not to get you in trouble. No, no, no. I, I, yeah. I, I really appreciate the management, and I would like to have a conversation with everybody. We've talked about me as a property manager before. That's really That's good. Thing. No, you yeah. should do that. And yeah, you don't want to get them in trouble. That's fine. That said, if you talk to them about it and you suddenly find you get non-renewed, um, <laughs> give us a call. Um, <laughs> issue number two is uh, special cleaning inspections for people who have uh, support animals that include black lights. Your thoughts on that? If they're not doing it for all people who have animals, they're being discriminatory. If they're not doing all it for people. all people. All people. Yeah. Yeah. All people. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. people. Yeah. Who here would be super excited to live in a place where they came through and did blacklight inspections of your apartment every week? <laughs> I'd be tempted to leave them little gifts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so it is 11.45, it's time for lunch. Uh, we will be back here with more exciting information at 1 p.m. <laughs>